this is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. In the mid-1980s, Dag was a T-72 tank commander in the NVA, the East German Army, and he's now a volunteer at the Tank Museum at Bovington in the UK. He describes his initial and tank commander training, the battle readiness of the NVA, the challenges of a conscript army, as well as a startling revelation about a very significant change in doctrine in 1987. We also dig deep into the technical details of the T-72, including the autoloader, deep water wading, and its advantages and disadvantages versus NATO tanks. Dag also talks about how Soviet World War II learnings were applied into the MVA, and his regiment's role and deployment area in the event of war. He shares a frank view and great insight into life in the MVA as a tank commander and the challenges of life beyond the NVA as the wall opens and all he has known disappears. I'm delighted to welcome Dag to our Cold War conversation. So effectively two months after I finished my apprenticeship, I started my next apprenticeship, if you want to call it like that. Did you have any choice as to what arm you were going to go into? with your call in up. theory when you when you decided to um, serve more than the 18 months conscription period which i did in theory you had the choice in reality they they tried to match your choices um, with the requirement in terms of manpower and sometimes you were lucky to maybe get one of your three choices, not necessarily your mo- most favorite one, but uh, in, in some cases it worked out. In other cases, I know it didn't, uh, but that's a different story and that needs to be told by someone who had that experience, unfortunately, because I com- can't comment. Uh, I must say what I did was not necessarily on top of my list, but it was certainly one of the five options or choices I put down. So what, one of your choices was to work in the armoured forces of the NVA. Well, it, let's put it this way. One of the choices was um, to work in, the, yeah, to, or to serve in, in, the, in, in a tank unit. Yes. What was the uh, initial training for that requirement like? That was the um, effectively six months at a special uh, training facility to be trained as a tank commander. Um, that included the basic training, so it is it was uh, different to what the um, British forces did. We had our six weeks basic training. Uh, during that six weeks, there were still some changes made um, in relation to what you would do later on, depending on specific requirements and if someone met the requirements or not. And then we started for the remaining four and a half months um, our specialized training um, to become a tank commander. And once we passed that uh, or finished that uh, at the end with the exams and everything, um, we were then posted to the various regiments and that's where it differed significantly because in uh, to, to the british army because in east germany you were called up and that was it you had no choice where you went um, you had no choice into which regiment you went it was really down to the requirements regiment a needs so many tank commanders trained on T-72 by October 1986, and that was it. And then we were trained and posted accordingly. There was a slight difference for those who who, who signed up as a professional NCO, uh, 
that means those who served 10 years as a minimum, um, they had a certain degree of choice where they would go. And in most cases, as I remember, it worked out unless someone was really misbehaving or not misbehaving, but winding up the the training staff and then uh, that person would not necessarily get where they wanted to initially. <laughs> So as soon as you were conscripted, you knew you were going to be trained as a tank commander, or was that? Yes. That, so, and and how did they, why did they think you'd make a good tank commander? I don't know. Honestly, I really don't know. I think in hindsight, one of the reasons might be my uh, then initial apprenticeship, because uh, of a very technical education and the uh, rather complex technology in a 72 um i must have it certainly helped me to grasp a lot of the technical bits much much quicker than the guys who came from a say construction background we we had guys who um were trained as a uh, nurses and things like that why they didn't put them into the medical corps i have no idea they ended up as as a tank commander because they probably already fulfilled the quota for uh, nurses <laughs> yes yes most likely or there maybe there was even a rule because uh, as probably a uh, british army military medical treatment is very different to civilian medical treatment it may have changed now, but certainly then it was uh, a joke. I'm not sure if that is political, but it was a joke. You are only off sick when you turn up at a medical center with your arm under your other arm. Then you are sick, but anything else is just, well, what do you want? <laughs> what regiment were you assigned to in the NVA? Well, I was in Tank Regiment 22, which was part of the 9th Tank Division. Um, and we were based, surprisingly, probably to many, as far away from the border to West Germany as you could be. We could virtually or technically walk into Poland. It was about 12 kilometers. So, um, absolutely no way that we could jump in a tank and be at the border in 20 minutes or well, the border to west germany as i said we were really at the on the other side of um of east germany and could that have been because of solidarity and the uh you know, the uh, developments in, in Poland at that period, because the end of the 80s, solidarity had reappeared after martial law, hadn't it? Uh, yes, but uh, no, it had nothing to do with that. That whole area was actually built up in the 50s when, it, when the NVA didn't even exist. And that's where the first tank units, which then technically belonged to the German police, the Kaserniete Volkspolizei, were set up, and uh, or the, the 9th Tank Division has been located in that area effectively since 1956. So there was nothing new; it was always there. So that's like a tra like a training area similar to Saltau, which was one of the NATO exercise training areas in West Germany. No, no, no. That is is totally different. That was really the. Uh, location of pretty much an entire tank division so three tank regiments a motorized infantry regiment all the other related units at um, divisional level so artillery regiments um, and so on and uh, we had a relatively small training area within that location um, relatively small, I mean, still big enough to, to do two, three day exercises at, well, up to battalion level. But anything bigger than that, we would then travel towards the large air training area between Berlin and Magdeburg, 
and would also use training uh, areas technically designated and owned, well, not owned, but um, primarily used by the Soviet forces in East Germany. Were you told about the forces that you'd encounter, particularly NATO armor? Were you briefed on the uh, different types? We didn't know which units we were facing, but we did know certainly when um, in 87, the entire doctrine changed suddenly in May, where it was um, announced that whatever happened, we will defend East Germany and not cross into West Germany. Uh, that was a big change because up to then, and when I did my initial training, it was still, we will not attack, but we will, if forced, defend and counterattack into West Germany. And then in May 87, it was not a, a East German announcement. It was actually a decision within the Warsaw Pact state. Um, it was announced that there's a complete change of doctrine, and the focus is now defending East Germany and not getting into West Germany. Um, we would stop at the West German border. That, that's really interesting. So was that a Soviet directive? Because that's around about the time Gorbachev comes into power. I, I think there was, there was, yeah, that, that was probably the driving force behind it, because the Warsaw Pact would not decide anything or they could not decide anything without the Soviet Union actually giving the go-ahead. To be fair, I think NATO would not do anything without getting approval from the United States, neither then nor now. I mean, what was your view of the the Western NATO? Did you see them as the enemy? They were the potential enemy, um, as I would say, everyone who serves in an army will see an opposing army. They're not my my personal enemy, if that makes sense, but I signed up to serve in the army. I signed up to serve my country, irrespective if it is seen as a good or bad country from the other side. But for that time, for the three years, I effectively gave away a certain degree of freedom to serve my country. And if it would have come to a war, yes, I would have seen a NATO tank as my enemy, because at the end of the day, they were after my life. I'm not saying they were hating me. And I certainly was contrary to many beliefs. I was never trained or educated or um, indoctrinated to hate someone. Uh, the attempts were there, but as I said at the beginning, it it didn't it couldn't work for people who lived a civilian life, be a conscript or a short term NCO like me, and knew they were going back to a civilian life. Yes, there were probably even conscripts who were members of the party and who really believed that there's someone out there to get them. And that is something they have to live with. Um, for me, it was really the decision, well, yeah, okay, um, the enemy invades my home country and um, I have to stop them. That, that was a main thing. Irrespective of any consideration of the other side being good or bad, you knew that whatever happens will destroy pretty much your entire home country. And I know that at least quite a few people in the West German army I spoke to since knew the same. They knew that if this thing really goes off, about half of West Germany wouldn't be inhabitable afterwards. And that is something which, in my opinion, those people who lived through that, especially who served in the, in an army on both sides, 
are very well aware of, even now. But I'm not sure that a lot of people now, nowadays, can kind of appreciate um, how this, how bad the situation was, especially in the early 80s. So fighting fellow Germans, you know, if if they were attacking your country, then that was that was something you'd be uh, prepared to to do. That would never have happened. The interesting thing is that the East German government made a request that the East German army never have to fight West German units. That is documented. And the Soviet Union, uh, or in this particular case, the uh, joint headquarters of the Warsaw Pact, um, accepted that. I think that was done for the same reason as the uh, Soviet Army headquarters decided not to send East German troops into Czechoslovakia in 68. Because, yes, there would have been, I'm not talking about the Czechoslovakia 68 now, but when East German units would have fought West German units, there would have been an additional, or in modern speak, public relations problem they would have had on both sides, certainly in East Germany, when it became public that East German units um, are forced to fight West German units. And I, I believe that even the Soviet Union were, was aware of, of that uh, problem. And they knew that whilst the East German army, the NVA, was um, a very highly trained and and motivated army which is even recognized or was recognized by the by nato that would push it too far and they would suddenly lose potentially a significant amount of fighting strength if they do that i don't know how it was elsewhere but certainly um our regiment if not the entire division that is well or was then uh too much knowledge for my rank and pay grade. Um, we would have uh, been moved towards um, Lübeck and Hamburg to prevent the Jutland Corps coming down Denmark into northwest East Germany. We would probably have met a few Americans as well and British troops, um, which were stationed near Bremen. Um, but that's the off chance that the, uh, the main target or the main enemy forces were the Jutland Corps. But you you didn't know that that was going to be your role. That that you said that was a, a outside of your pay grade, or did you actually plan for that? I only know that our regiment, the tank regiment twenty two, was supposed to help to stop you, the Jutland Corps coming down, but the regiment is far too small, so I assume it was the entire division. The entire tank, tank division would, would, would have um, uh, been given that task, but I don't know for certain, and that's what I meant with my knowledge and my pay grade, um, because I was just a tank commander, so I would um, only know detailed or would only have detailed information up to company level maximum and we didn't have that beforehand anyway we didn't even know where we would go would be going we only knew roughly um the area and who our enemy would be we i i don't even know if there were any pre prepared uh, defense positions or, or something like that were you regularly carrying live ammunition because I I hear stories of the the MVA and the and the Red Army just being ready to roll out the barracks at any time, is that a myth? No, it's true. I was the un, one of the few unfortunate guys who did not have a battle ready tank, but um, about eighty percent of the regiment was ready to go. There was everything on the tank, including the ammunition. The only thing not on there was the explosives which the commanders were trained to use um, in case you have to uh, get through any 
um, obstacle barricades or whatever, uh, or if you had to um, prepare a def defense position and you couldn't do it with the um, tools you had on your tank, but everything else was there. So we had our full load of, of ammunition um, for all the machine guns. Um, we had, um, of course, our, our personal weapons, uh, which were at the barracks itself, but we would pick them up when we dashed out. The, the tanks were full of fuel um, and everything you needed. And all well, the first tanks would roll out of the regiment about 25 minutes 30 minutes after the alarm was raised. Wow. That's some degree of readiness. That. And the other thing is 85% of the men had to be at the barracks at any time. And only from yeah end of 86, this was, was reduced to 50% uh, for periods like Christmas, New Year's Eve, um, that was then split, so half of the regiment went home over Christmas, the other half over New Year's Eve. And then I think the same was for Easter and Whitsun. Yes. Um, and that was hard work because um, the Soviet forces in East Germany didn't like that idea. But it was a kind of move they had to, or decision they had to make because they couldn't, and that was actually a sign of the changing times. The indoctrination just didn't work anymore. Because it was common knowledge in East Germany that effectively the Bundeswehr went home on Friday lunchtime and came back on Monday lunchtime. Yes, there were a few ex uh, um, exercises and so on, but that was not the, the Bundeswehr. Or for that matter, as I know now, um, the British Army kind of went on the piss on Friday evening and uh, woke up with a hangover on Monday morning. So there was no point for us being there at the weekend, with, especially where we were stationed, not much to do. If you were going to cross the border, it was going to be a weekend. Well, that, that was something where we were always joking. Um, if they really wanted to go, they should do it on a, on a on a Friday or Saturday morning because nobody would there would be there, and uh, we wouldn't have to do anything. We would just drive in and uh, take the <laughs> barracks. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you were being trained as a tank commander, did you were you trained in all the different roles of your crew? In a way, yes, because well, that has two reasons. One was that, um, of course, the commander had to be fully capable to use the um, armament of the tank. And we were also trained not to be a fully qualified driver, but uh, to be able to drive the tank within its parameters, so not to destroy it whilst driving it, in case that, for example, something happened when your driver was on leave, then the commander would actually become the driver of the tank. The driver would be called back immediately to join the unit, but until the driver joined the unit, I would be the driver of my tank. And my gunner was would be acting as commander and gunner at the same time. To what extent the cross-training was done in the end, uh, was very much dependent on a how you got on within the crew, and b um, how interested, especially the gunner was, because the gunner was a conscript. And um, again, we're going back to the selection process. I was lucky, um, certainly with my first gunner. He was uh, at least bright. He wasn't keen to be there, as any conscript wasn't necessarily keen to be there. But um, to keep himself mentally switched on, he realized that it might be a good idea to do a little bit more than just what he was supposed to be or supposed to do as a conscript. The gunner I had for the last um, few months before I left, unfortunately, I have to say he was the wrong person for that role. He he couldn't cope with it 
on a mental basis. It's not in uh, in in, in a, uh, I don't want to uh, talk him down. He couldn't grasp the complexity of what he had to do. He came from a from a non technical background. He um, he, he was working on a on a collective farm. Apparently, a very good. He was very good at what he was doing, but totally unsuited for something which required a certain level of uh, technical knowledge and understanding to to handle and operate um, the gunnery equipment. As I said, it, it's not his fault. He was just put into the wrong place. Uh, and by doing that, um, in a way, the tank would have been much less effective. Active. Yeah, and I, I guess that underlines the challenges of having a conscript army rather than a professional army. Yes, that that is that is one of of the problems uh, and the difficulties, and uh, I think that was also one of the significant problems in the East German army. Um, they, at least the at the upper end, it was very late that they realized that the more technological advances are introduced into the army into the equipment we use or any army uses you have to become more selective in who you pick to operate the kit uh, and equipment and also you have to realize that the times are over where um, a short period of time is enough to make someone efficient. They noticed that, for example, with tank drivers, because in the East German Army, tank drivers also served for three years. They were no, not, not conscripts. Only at the end, in 88, they started to bring conscripts in again as uh, tank drivers because they couldn't get enough people to sign up for three years. Uh, that had something to do with the possibility to get into a higher rank and also the um, overall difficulties being a driver effectively not getting a pay rise for three years or two and a half years once you join the regiment um, in all us the Warsaw Pact um, armies a tank driver would have been a conscript in the Soviet army it was different because they have a, had a conscription period of two years anyway so that is only a year short of a short-term NCO in the East German army, but still, uh, I think in Poland and the Czech Republic, it was only 18 months. But to go back to the initial uh, question, yeah, um, I can still boast that I uh, I have actually a driving license for a T-72. And um, you, you didn't get that for nothing. Um, you still had to do a certain level of technical training because you had to be able to maintain the tank, at least the basic maintenance as well, and basic repairs. Um, but my my main focus was obviously on the gunnery equipment. And and you still keep your hand in at the uh, tank museum at Bovingdon? Yes. Yes, I do. I didn't expect that, to be honest, when I visited the museum for the first time, but... Uh, um, and I didn't expect that I will ever touch a tank again after I left the army. Again, that highlights as uh, how far removed we were from what would happen uh, late in 1989 when I left the army in uh, end of February 89. Um, the only time I was really thinking about seeing a tank again would have been when I... Uh, would be called up for some three months reservist duty or something like that, but not as a hobby at tanks, which I would have fought about 35 years ago, and now I'm free to get into and to work on them. <laughs> well, they probably didn't get many East German tank commanders walking in the doors offering to uh, volunteer, I, I, no, I guess. No, I, so, I, uh... I am the only one delighted that you're uh, talking to me um what were your thoughts on the performance of the t72 how did you rate it well that is something where i i got a, a lot of interesting comments on the um youtube video released by the tank museum a 
don't forget that when I served on a T-72, nobody knew about the first or the second Gulf War and the performance of the T-72. Also, uh, I cannot compare it against anything else. I only know the T-72. I, yes, I've been inside a T-55, but I never operated it. I find my way around it, but I have no idea how how difficult it is to command it. Uh, the intricacies, um, the the quality of the of the gun equipment, and all that. Um, I still maintain that a T seventy two is a well trained crew, even nowadays, um, is a very good tank, provided the T seventy two is used within the purpose and framework it was designed for. Yes, it was designed in the late 60s, early 70s, and the doctrine then was to go in as fast as you can with as many tanks as you can. And it was known that the survivability rate was not great. Officially, that was never mentioned, but of course, if you're halfway clued up and know about how uh, a nuclear explosion works and what it does to the crews and the equipment, when you also have, from your normal um, training in the army, an understanding what you're facing and keep a sense of reality, I don't think I would have survived a day. That was a harsh reality. Um, yes, there were others who really believed that after a nuclear strike on the battlefield, you just send your people around and collect the wounded and carry on. To be honest, uh, I don't know where these officers got their information from, but uh, they must certainly not have paid attention during their biology and physics lesson in regards to what a nuclear um, explosion would do. But we're going back to what I said at the beginning, well, not at the beginning, but a while ago. In my opinion, when you sign up for to serve in an army, in any army, you do sign your life away at the bottom line. You have to accept it. That's why you are a soldier. It sounds harsh. It may sound even cold-hearted, but that is the reality when you decide to become a soldier. However long, even when you're a conscript and you can't get away from it, for that period, you are not controlling your life. Someone else controls your life by order. And that is something I believe a lot of people easily forget. The T-72 the is is unusual compared to the nato tanks it, it had this auto loader which meant you you had one less crew member mm -hmm. than most of the nato tanks yeah was that a, a benefit would you say again it is very difficult for me because i don't really have a way to compare it because i don't know anything else so i knew i i always had to do everything with three people with three men in my crew. And I had to manage all that, um, which funnily enough did not change. So the requirements in terms of maintenance, um, guard duty, when on exercise and so on, making sure your driver gets enough rest and so on, that didn't change, but you had one pair of hands less to do it. So overall, I think the additional workload uh, taken on by the fewer crew members um, did make life more difficult. It certainly reduced the rest periods. On the other hand, again, I think it all depends how well the crew works together. It is one thing to be a crew or be three people in a tank or on a tank and being three people on a tank as a well-jailed crew. So I knew I could go away 
for a briefing, for example, or a reconnaissance with a company commander. And the driver would do what he has to do. I didn't have to tell him. The gunner would do what he had to do. And when he is done, he would help the driver. Um, they would also do some of the things I would do in my absence. So you found ways around it. Um, and I think to some extent, if you are on exercise, you are after the second day running on adrenaline anyway. You don't care. And the next thing is, if you are 20, 21, okay, the gunner might be 24, 25, but still, um, you're not an old man. You can take things which 20, 30 years later, you ask yourself, how did I manage that? Um, yeah. I would would fall, would be dead after two days, and you did it for seven days. Um, so yeah. it is a very peculiar environment. Overall, I personally think that the autoloader, and I speak now from an engineering perspective, was a brilliant design. It still is a brilliant design, and eventually it will find its way into modern tanks. Um, due to technological development. The the rounds will get too heavy to handle safely in the confines of a tank turret by a human being. Keep in mind that the first attempts to do something like, well, at least the semi-automatic loader were actually done, at least in the Soviet Union, at the end of World War II because they already realized that the, the rounds are getting too big and too heavy to handle inside the confines of a tank. Um, and technology moves on. We're now cons uh, waiting for the Challenger refurbishment. And as far as I know, there are already concerns that the rounds might get a bit too heavy for the crew to handle safely. And I know that the same discussion is ongoing with Leopard uh, in Germany, um, where the rounds get simply too long to be handled safely, because you need more and more explosives to get the actual round up to a speed to be eff effective at two kilometers to go through 60, 80, 100 centimeter of, centimeters of armor. So it's a it's the the constant battle in tank development, um, armor mobility and survivability. And did the auto loader give you a better rate of fire? Um, that that is an ongoing debate um, because a lot of people say that a human loader is is faster, and they say the uh, a human could put the, the first round in before the engagement well i can do that with my autoloader um that's that's not a point the problem in a way with the autoloader is that certainly if you assume the ideal circumstances that you need the same round for the next engagement it will take about 6 to 7 seconds to load the round but on the other hand yes a well trained loader can be quicker, but is he still as quick after 10 rounds? Because I can press the button to autoload, irrespective of the type of ammunition. But in the worst case, I can empty my autoloader in about three minutes. 22 rounds in three minutes. I do not believe that even a well-trained loader can keep up that rate of fire. An autoloader doesn't get tired, whereas yeah. a human does. I, I mean, I mean, it it is just a, a theoretical exercise, and I can only stress that, like um, a lot of ex tank crew I talk to, we are usually in agreement that we never had to find out who is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good conversation over a few pints, I guess. Yes. Did you ever see any NATO equipment as part of your training? Did they ever show you? No, only 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 photos. Um, so the the well, for most people, the dreaded recognition classes. I really enjoyed it. 
photos, sketches, drawings, um, technical information. We even had information on where the weak areas were should it ever come to a uh, tank versus tank fight, effectively pointing out where it is most likely to secure a hit um, or safely secure a hit and damage or even destroy the tank. But I have never seen any NATO equipment, not even something like an SA-80 uh, or the, the West German G3, um, yeah, things like that. Did you ever come across any of the Allied military liaison missions during your service? Um, let's put it this way, not directly. I only remember one time we went on to onto an exercise. I don't know which one it was. It might have been when we uh, went to the uh, river crossing training, the underwater uh, submerged training. I do remember our company commander running around like an, excuse me for the term, but like an idiot, because someone had spotted some Asian car, apparently on a bridge taking photos. And for some reason, some of the tanks didn't have their tactical numbers properly concealed. So as far as he was concerned, um, the West would now launch an immediate attack because um, they know that a certain company was moving certain tanks to a training area. As I said, some people seem to, even in hindsight, believe that this was a situation. We effectively said, look, um, in one of the uh, monthly military magazines, you always got information, oh, there is a new military spy satellite being sent up by the US and so on. Well, with all these um, satellites, they probably already knew that we were moving before we started to move. Um, so what's all that fuss about? Um, he calmed down. Obviously, we were told about them. On the other hand, where we were, I don't think they would have blatantly driven into it. The risk was, I think, even for them, far too big to be um, apprehended, which we, by the way, couldn't do. We were not allowed to do anything. The only thing we could do was if we had the means to box the vehicle in. We were not supposed to talk to them, nothing. Um, the only thing we would have have done would be to call the duty officer, report it. He would have called the nearest um, Soviet army unit and they would have dealt with them. That was it. Um, I'm pretty certain they were, they were laughing their heads off when we were doing exercises, uh, certainly taking loads and loads of photos, but I have never seen one. The only time I've, I've actually seen one and I still remember that uh, was when I was a child, when they, for some reason, came to Rostock for a sightseeing tour, I assume, uh, probably not just the architecture, but uh, some other things as well. But they were Americans in full uniform. And the most important thing for us as a kid was they stood in the queue and probably bought for 20 kids ice cream. That was a it was a good thing. Um, I still remember that. But when I was in the army, I do not recall anything apart from, as I said, yeah. yeah, when we did guard duty, that was always a thing, how we dealt with them. But I never encountered anyone. We knew they were around, yeah. but that was it. You, you mentioned earlier about the river crossing training. Now, this is another one of the things that, that made the T-72 and some of the other Soviet uh, tanks different to uh, NATO was this ability to do this deep water wading. Can you just describe how that works and what that was like doing? What a lot of people forget is that technically the Leopard could do exactly the same. They just needed a little bit more of preparation time because they they always had the the big ex escape tube rather than the, the narrow snorkel on the on the Soviet tanks. Um, but overall, it was based on the assumption that the battlefield will be in Central Europe, so primarily 
Germany. Um, maybe taking into account a little bit or, or, or Poland as well, and then the Benelux states, maybe some parts of France. And on average, I think it was every 15 or 20 kilometers, you had some kind of water obstacle. Um, and the idea was to be prepared for that. Um, I think the Soviet army knew that again from the uh, experience of World War II um, when they had to cross their very, very wide rivers in the Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, I, I've been to Kiev in, in 2003 and um, walked across a bridge crossing the um, Dnieper. And we're talking about 800 meters of river. And not just, oh, it's a little bit deep uh, in the middle. Uh, it is quite deep across. And from the Soviet perspective, they effectively came from the east. So from flat land without any protection against a very steep rock face, effectively, uh, covering quite a long part of the western um, bank of the, of the river. And I think it was that experience and the amount of equipment and men they lost when they uh, went into Kiev. And I mean, the same happened on, on, in, in other places, which gave, the, gave them the idea to, to really uh, consider going under river, uh, underwater. And a, overall, certainly the T-55 uh, uh, series uh, and the T-72, I know 64 and T-80 had the same. They carried everything they needed to prepare the tank in about 20 to 25 minutes, just with the three-man crew to cross um, a river underwater. Of course, that would not be decided uh, by a tank commander, by a company commander, or even uh, the commanding officer of a regiment, because that would require any, at least a large tactical gain, if not a strategic gain. And the area where this would happen would be effectively hell on earth, because every piece of available artillery Air Force, helicopters, what have you, would be there to protect this little piece of river to make sure that a regiment and whatever else needs to get across there, gets across there safely to expand potentially the bridgehead and then get through the enemy defense on the other side. The, um, the process in itself was relatively I know I say it, it sounds strange when I say it, relatively simple. You prepared your tank, um, you um, did a check that it was sealed properly, effectively by uh, letting the engine run, closing all the hatches, and then make sure that you reached a certain level of under pressure before the engine uh, died of air starvation. And that was it. Then you would put on your rebreather in the ready state so you wouldn't actually wear it and then you would be told to move to the next stage then there would be a, a final check all the necessary covers were closed by a dedicated team outside not a tank crew and then the driver would um zero the um the gyro compass to an orientation mark at the other side of the river, uh, at the other bank, and then you would just drive in, drive through, and on the other side you would come out. The commander had to give the command to the gunner to move the turret, which would automatically, through a very interesting linkage at the back of the tank, um, would open all the covers and um, in a battle situation we would unscrew or the gunner would unscrew the snorkel from the inside it would drop off, you would close a little hatch uh, and you were ready to go. The only thing you had to remember is 
your first round had to be an armor-piercing thin stabilized sabo because that is the only round without a fuse at the point of the round because you had to uh, destroy the rubber cover which was sealing the gun from any water ingress. If you forgot that and you had a high, expl high explosive or a heat round in it, um, you didn't have a gun after that because um, the round would go off within your gun and you would have something which looked like a peeled banana. Yeah, I've seen photos of uh, where rounds have, have gone off like that. I mean, what, what was it like being in the tank underwater? It was weird. I would say if you if you ha have been in a submarine or, or uh, have watched movies um, where they have scenes in a submerged submarine, your sound... Or any any sound sounds different. Of course, at the back of your mind, um, you <laughs> know that something could happen at any time. Uh, the gunnery site yeah. that you had on the T-72, was that thermal imaging? No. Um, no, we, we had a, a normal um, image intensifying night vision system for both commander and gunner, but we did not have any thermal sites. And uh, But on the other hand, obviously, we did have a, a laser rangefinder in a T-72 um, with some <coughs> basic, say, computing options. Um, but you still needed to do a lot of, um, well, not, not manual input, but you had to knew the the way how you correct for wind uh, speed and, and other things. Um, we we did have, for example, in a T seventy two, the possibility to um, when you were firing on the move, the you did not have to adjust for the distance the tank traveled. That was automatically subtracted from the measured distance once you you had the distance to the uh, to the target. Overall, I I still think that again, a well-trained crew could have used certainly. I have to say it like this: in the late eighties, um, could have used the um, T seventy two to to a very good effect. Mainly because a lot of people forget you cannot compare the battlefield which would have been Germany with the wide open spaces in Iraq. You would not have been able to fight, to even engage a tank over three and a half thousand meters in 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 the German area. It it's well, it might be possible in some in in very few areas, but on average, and I had that confirmed by by several um, former U.S. and British tank commanders, and actually I had it confirmed just at Tankfest by a young Challenger 2 commander, they are training in gunnery up to 2,000 meters. Everything beyond that is, even with modern systems, pot luck. Because you simply cannot um, adjust for something which you don't know. And even with modern uh, um, rounds, they are fast. But after a certain time, the law of physics still apply. And if you have a, a strong side wind after two and a half or three thousand meters, which you cannot necessarily see and observe, you cannot adjust for it. And your uh, gunnery control system cannot adjust for it. So uh, my respect to the guys um, who did these things um, uh, firing at tanks of three and a half thousand meters and respect to the guy who did the um, the 5,000 meter shot but that in my opinion was one off and not in a cold war battle scenario you wouldn't have had the time to do that 
Um, did you train much with your Soviet counterparts, or were you quite separate from them? Interestingly, I never did. Um, I was supposed to be on a joint exercise. I've never seen them. The closest I came to um, the Soviet Un Soviet Army Union was during our river crossing training, when they pitched up about half a mile next to us, and uh, that was it. So we saw them, but despite our efforts, we were told in no uncertain terms that uh, this is not something which is looked at favorably when we try to get over there and talk to them and so on. Uh, I don't know why. Um, one thing I found out after the war came down and was reading up on that was that it was actually down to the change in East German Army command after Defense Minister Hoffmann passed away in 85, that this entire idea of joint training and so on kind of died a death. One reason being apparently that the East German Army got too good. You were going to show up the Soviets. Yes. <laughs> if that is true, I don't know. But I, as I said, um, we, we had one or two meetings, but not in terms of exercise. Um, we went to uh, one unit which had a kind of partnership relationship with our regiment, uh, which was pretty common. But that was really just uh, effectively to say hello. We hoped, and I still regret that um, we didn't get the chance, we hoped to get a look into a T-80 because we knew that regiment had T-80s. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. So that is the bit where I really regret um, not having had the chance to at least have a look inside one. But uh, that's life. Um, it's still one to do. Um, and by the way, the reason why we wanted to wander over to the uh, Soviet Army unit during the river crosser train crossing training was um, they turned up with T-64s. So at least a few of us who had an interest um, were quite keen, but uh, yeah, we were not allowed. And uh, the, the next day they were they disappeared. So it was all a bit sad, unfortunately. Yeah, it's interesting because you always see those propaganda photos where your brothers in arms and you know working together, but uh, the reality was uh, vastly different. Yes, um, and but to be honest, I think, um, as I said before, that was probably the case uh, in the sixties and seventies, when the uh, when there were still a lot of much closer relationships, um, certainly at the highest uh, army level on both sides. Um, but that may have uh, kind of disappeared over the years. And as I said, maybe there is a certain grain of truth in the statement that the East German army just became too good for something like that. We couldn't actually learn anything. They rather started to learn from the East German army. Uh, I hear about NATO troops being quite competitive on exercises versus other nations. Was, was there a similar sort of rivalry? on Warsaw Pact exercises? Um, I really don't know because I never took part in a in a large exercise like that uh, in my three years in the army. There were occasionally um, things like um, who is the best driver, for example, tank driver. And I know they were done from um, battalion level to regimental level to divisional level. And my first driver, he became the best driver in the division. But I do not recall if there were any Soviet or maybe even Polish drivers in that competition. I really, really don't know. We, I, I certainly never did something in terms of gunnery uh, training um, against Soviet tank crews. Uh, or, or with uh, with Polish tank crews in a 
in a kind of uh, competitive exercise. How was radio communications handled? Were you communicating in German or yes. was it all in Russian? No, no, okay. it was it was in German. The uh, Of course, we used um, or we, we had our uh, call signs and things like that. But um, at the end of the day, uh, it was relatively easy to work out if someone really listened into who was doing what um, and when. But um, yeah, everything was done via radio communication, um, except in situations where, for example, on uh, on exercise, for tactical reasons, it was decided that there is radio silence, and then we use the um, the hand, or in our case, of course, the flag signals, or um, the torch signals at night, and. Contrary to the um, urban story, that had nothing to do with the fact that there were no radios in the tanks. Um, my first six months in the regiment, I actually spent on a T-72 with two radios. And my job, that was the tank of the company commander, and um, my job was to monitor the battalion net, uh, and he could deal with the company net to use British Army terms. So um, there was definitely no shortage of radios. They may have been a little bit antiquated to some extent because they were still operating with valves. On the other hand, um, again, considering that we're talking about the Cold War, a radio based on valves would still work after a nuclear explosion whereas a radio with microchips would have slight problems. With with the exercises, were there many accidents that happened, or did you just not get to hear about those? Well, I mean, it, it depends um, what you class as an accident. I mean, I have seen parts being ripped off tanks because um, they turned too, too tight and... Uh, actually hit a tree and uh, because of the momentum the whole front sort of cover over the tr um, track was ripped off it, it was a hinged part um, by design but it came off during my training i actually drove straight into a, a very deep hole uh, at a very high speed i just didn't see it coming yeah i I actually hit my head quite badly, and the instructor uh, was furious uh, because um, he had a nosebleed and everything else. So, if that is an exercise, uh, an accident, yes, I mean, I did it. I did see it. I cannot recall any accident during live firing exercises. I mean, that was an absolute safety conscious um, exercise uh, and very tightly controlled, and. I mean, other things did happen, uh, falling off a tank, breaking a leg, um, things like that. But um, as I said, I've, I never heard about accidents where people actually got killed. Um, well, actually, that is not true. We had one exercise during, well, actually, it wasn't our exercise. We did normal gunnery training at the training establishment. and. Um, nearby, the uh, motorized infantry did some training with BMPs, and um, as we found out afterwards, um, we did only hear the scream. In the evening um, or in the afternoon, every training was stopped. We all had to go back into the barracks and had a briefing because a breach of the um, health and safety rules led to the death of a trainee infantry section commander he left the bmp through the rear doors and the permanent staff driver so not a trainee driver but an instructor as a driver ignored the light indicating that the rear doors are still open and um, started to reverse and unfortunately the uh, guy got somehow entangled with the door and uh, he effectively re reversed over him. So that was the only 
a serious accident I'm aware of. Again, I didn't witness it. I and the other um, people in in my uh, training section heard the scream, but um, we at that point didn't add one and one together. That only dawned on us um, in the afternoon when we had the briefing. And um, as soon as something like that happened, everything slowed down um, because of that. Certainly when there was live ammunition, moving vehicles or anything else involved. Over the radio, yes, I did hear um, of a few incidents, like as you mentioned earlier, an exploded gun because someone drove um, on a live firing exercise the gun hit the ground. There was some earth or anything in the barrel. They didn't check properly before they fired or loaded the first round, and the front end of the gun came off. Um, the The funny thing was, in a way, it was an officer, but it wasn't from our regiment, so we don't really know what happened afterwards. But um, otherwise, uh, yes, any any serious accident would have led to an additional extra briefing, rehearsal, um, and reiteration that the health and safety rules are not just there for fun. It is boring, but you have to follow them. That's really interesting because I think sometimes people have the opinion that there was less value placed in life in the Warsaw Pact. And I guess that might have been the case with the with the the Red Army, but hearing about health and safety rules and and things like that is is interesting i wasn't i wasn't expecting that for some reason i just i just thought that there'd be uh you know less value placed on life but obviously not in the mva i mean i have a good example for tank crews on a t72 you have uh when you stand in front of the tank looking backwards on the left hand side you have the coaxial machine gun next to the main gun you would enter the tank always, and I still do it now. I don't even think about it. You get onto a T-72 on the right-hand side. If you entered on the left-hand side, you wouldn't get court-martialed, but in a worst case, you would at least um, use uh, or get some additional work because you could get yourself potentially killed because you have no idea about the state of that gun because you haven't been in the tank. That's how, how it was looked at. And that was really uh, put into us from day one. It doesn't matter. You have to be on the tank, all hatches closed in 10 seconds, but you do not use the shortest way. You always get onto the tank on the right-hand side. You run around the turret at the back, and then you get in. The funny thing is that when you ran, ran was when you were running around the turret, you were running past a 12.7 millimeter air anti-aircraft gun, which technically could also be loaded. So, but on the other hand, you could see from the outside if there is actually um, an ammunition box attached to it and a belt going through it. So there was a certain degree of knowing that it is relatively safe. Whereas for the coaxial machine gun, you wouldn't know because you, you can't look inside the turret. Were you were you ever given any training as to what to do if you were captured? Um, yes, but there was very basic training. Um, we would we we did not have something like uh, interrogate interrogation training, but we were told or we knew which information we could give under the Geneva Convention and the uh, Hague Convention, and that was it. Uh, we were not prepared in any way, shape, or form for any kind of interrogation. And that, by the way, is also the reason why an East German tank commander never had maps in the way NATO had them. We only had hand-drawn maps, <laughs> which we did ourselves during the briefing for the next stage of the battle exercise whatever so to make sure that if someone gets the the sketch there were no grid references so if you get caught about 
15 kilometers away from where you're supposed to be. Yes, you had a nice little technical tactical diagram knowing where your observation points are, your um, um, other uh, markers and so on, but no grid reference. So it would be, or without any additional information, it would be pretty useless unless someone knows the area very, very well and can work out from a simple hand-drawn sketch where to go. If that if that is effective or would have been effective, I don't know. But um, there's certainly, again, in my opinion, most of these ideas go back to the Soviet Union or Red Army experience in World War II. Right. So your your training was was based around that Soviet Red Army experience. So the the East German Army didn't look at at all at the the experience of the Wehrmacht and how they had no and um i know that even at the officer tra- officers training school um that was completely out of bound i asked um a few former officers and uh, one actually told me he asked for it um considering that he was actually told on a training course he did in the Soviet Union at the Tank Academy at Kiev that he should read the German World War II generals or even standard works like Guderian's Achtung Panzer. And he was told, and at that point I think he was already a captain, or was he already a major? Well, not, not a junior officer anymore. And he was told that he doesn't have to read that because the East German training manuals are based on the Soviet training manuals, and that's all he needs to know. How it was at the at Staff College, or in the East German terms, the Military Academy in Dresden, I don't know. I don't know anyone who went there um, and studied there, um, but uh, it might have been possible to do it there because that was the um, the place where you could get even as a as an officer your PhD. Um, so maybe they had the chance to read that, but certainly only, I would think, only at the library, not something to take home. But our, say, low-level training didn't even mention anything Wehrmacht. So no, no battles were analyzed. Kursk, of course, yes, it was well-known. Uh, Operation Bagration, the um, freeing of uh, Belarus, uh, that was, um, of course, um, discussed but only uh, from the red army perspective and how they effectively especially with and that is own, that is my own um description effectively the uh, ring of belarus was Guderian, as he described it about 10 years earlier that was proper blitzkrieg as the germans did it at the beginning of the war move fast don't care about anything left behind. Just go on and on and on and deal with the rest later, quite successfully, certainly for the first two weeks. If you had had to have attacked NATO, mm-hmm. how how do you think that the Warsaw Pact would have fared against them? Do, do you have any feel as to... I guess I guess your your confidence would have been pretty strong at least to start with. Yes, and I think um, that would be the same on both sides, because I think if you don't believe or don't have trust in your weapon system, be it, being it a tank, an aircraft, a ship, even even your your AK forty seven seventy four or your SA eighty. Okay, no, hang on, we better don't mention the SA eighty because I know um, that was not very well received. But whatever, if you don't trust your weapon as a soldier and have confidence in it and your own ability, I think you are in the wrong place. You must have that confidence in yourself, in your training and in your weapon system. If it then carries you through everything is a different matter. As I said earlier, considering that 
the survival rate, certainly for tank crews, was relatively low. If you didn't close your eyes and accepted that, I'm not saying uh, I would have acted like a Spartan or one of the Japanese kamikaze pilots, but it came as a necessary thing to do. The I think the um, the other problem was then. And it's probably not that much of a of a risk nowadays, certainly not at that scale. The willingness on both sides to consider nuclear tactical weapons or even grenades or mines on the battlefield. That was, in my opinion, actually a much bigger threat than having to fight another tank. Because at least with a tank, you know what you're getting into and what your chances are. And that's something you trained for. Whereas, yes, you may know what happens when a nuclear uh, missile goes off, but you have no way to escape. You're probably safe for a certain period, but there comes a point where you have to decide if you want to go out and get radiated to death or poison to death with whatever chemicals uh, is um, flying around in the air or on the ground, or just try to su survive as long as you can and no one is coming to get you and help you. So I really don't know. When you look back at your service in the NVA, what, what would you say was the, the best moment for you or the, or the moment you look back with the fondest memory? Um, there were several. Uh, certainly, um, despite making it sounding very easy, I was quite pleased when I got out of my tank after the tense river crossing and knowing this is it. I don't have to do it again. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, yes, it, it is. You are under a lot of pressure, but um, it is also very interesting. But it is a good thing to know you don't have to do it again. Another good experience and something I still think about is when I passed the exam for the highest gunnery qualification available in the East German Army for tank crews, which is an achievement even a lot of officers didn't do or get. It was hard work. Um, and it is very strange when you are a Lance Corporal and the lowest rank in the examination board is um, Lieutenant Colonel. Um, but I managed. And um, yeah, the, the last thing, and I know it sounds odd, was really when I walked through the barracks gate for the last time and knew I don't have to come back. Despite all the good experiences, the things I learned about myself, how far I could stretch myself, which sometimes even now upsets my colleagues when we work especially at nights, and I still push on when everyone else wants to go to bed. But And I, I, as I said, I, I learned a lot about myself, my limits, and um, what I'm good at if I have to and what I'm not so good at, and a certain degree of leadership, which sadly I have to say sometimes I cannot use nowadays because it was it would be politically incorrect. I mean, the style of leadership. But I guess that is something which pretty much every um, everyone who served in the army has to deal with. Did you stay in touch with any of your crew members? No, and that is um, something I sometimes regret, but I also think uh, that might just be because of the of the way um, the East German army worked. Um, the um, there never was, despite all efforts, um, something like uh, the the regimental ties uh, British soldiers have to their regiment. I was invited to several RTR gatherings. These are British Royal Tank Regiment gatherings, um, and it is impressive when you get taken there by 
an active serving officer. Well, he's retired now, but you meet people he served with 15, 20, 25 years ago, now in civilian life, not even in the army. And that is something which um, the East German army never had. I think a lot of conscripts would probably reject the idea outright anyway. But especially with the East German army, I think, due to the subsequent changes and impact these changes had after the war came down, if a close relationship didn't exist before that event, I don't think it would have survived or it would be possible afterwards. Um, keeping in mind that any one serving more than three years effectively lost his or her job because the army ceased to exist. There were a few who were taken over, but only for a certain period. And I would guess that there might still be officers who keep some sort of in touch because they used to live where they served, um, often in the same um, apartment blocks. So maybe maybe there there is some sort of of relationship um, meetings and so on. But no, I I certainly never met anyone. I met one of the tank drivers in my company, not my own, in 1990 in my hometown because he came from the same town. But it was briefly, um, I think we had a beer. Uh, it was pure coincidence. I can't remember either he missed his train or I missed my train or bus, something like that. Totally unexpected. And that was it. And I haven't seen him since. Yeah, I guess the the circumstances of the NVA and the circumstances of the demise of East Germany, for some people, it's something they want to forget. I guess that that probably also plays a significant part. Um, and to be honest, thinking about it, I probably had more discussions and gatherings with NATO tank crew since 1990 than I had with. Um, East German Army tank people. Well, you are the only English-speaking East German tank commander I have found so far. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think there is, <laughs> there's many of you around. Well, there, there is one, maybe, maybe a brief episode. I know it, it goes off a tangent, but I mentioned the Jutland Co earlier on. In I think it was 2005 or 2006, I went to Beltring, and. Um, I met a Danish chap who managed to import a T-72 into Denmark. So he invited me for a celebration of an army unit. And to cut a long story short, I actually met with a tank commander who knew exactly what my regiment was and was supposed to do. And he served at exactly the same time as me. So he in his Leopard 1 and me in my 72 should have fought each other and that was actually one of the best meetings i had yes i had meetings with um and are on, 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 on very good terms with tank crew in the us um obviously quite a few here in, in the uk not on, on on a regular basis but certainly um when there is an event tank museum the um uh we we talk um, but as I said, um, meeting with East German tank crews, no, definitely not. How do you hear about the opening of, of the Berlin Wall? Can you remember that moment? Um, yes, I was actually doing my evening classes, my A-levels in evening classes. I didn't actually know until I got home and my mum told me that the wall is open. I wasn't in the army anymore. What was your reaction to that? Well, initially disbelief. I mean, we knew, I knew something had to happen uh, because the demonstrations were ongoing, the, the, the famous Monday demonstrations uh, in Rostock, and I took part regularly, which doesn't make me a freedom fighter or whatever else a lot of people style themselves for. 
but change was needed. A lot of people forget that whilst the opening of the war was one of the aims, the it was initially not the aim to disband East Germany. That was never on the cards. That came onto the cards when Kohl realized which opportunity he had to get at least another term in office because his government was on the way out. So he was really lucky to have that opportunity, which then got him into or kept him in power for another or in government uh, for another two terms, I think. Um, but yeah, it was disbelief. And then, of course, the next day, despite the fact that I went to work, I don't think we did a lot of work. And that was that. And then you started to try to come to terms of it and try to estimate what's going to happen next and how it's going to happen. Can you remember the first time you, you went to either West Germany or West Berlin? Um, yes, that was relatively late. I think that was just the week before Christmas or something, simply because I didn't really want to travel in the most uncomfortable way possible, standing in a train for hours. We didn't have a car, but traveling by car was even worse. People complain about slow traffic on the M25. You haven't seen anything if you haven't been or if you hadn't trying to cross the, the uh, former um, border to West Germany in 1989. 25 to 30 kilometers back drop was normal. Um, I used to work for the local water board, a water company at that point. I remember we tried to get special permission to get a blue light for our um, duty vehicles uh, in case there is any problem with uh, either a water treatment pl a plant or a remote um, water pumping station. There was absolutely no way to get past the traffic otherwise. We didn't get it, unfortunately, but uh, it's something, uh, a trip which would normally take us about 90 minutes, easily took four to five hours. And that was effectively breaking pretty much any traffic rule possible just to get there and get at least some work done. We knew that the way back would be faster because no one was queuing on the way back. But getting there, if you traveled, had to travel west, was a pain for several weeks, if not months, if I remember correctly. Did the West live up to what you thought it would be like or or not? I know it's it's maybe the wrong term, but I did kind of take everything I I've seen and heard before with a certain pinch of salt, knowing that obviously there was propaganda on the other side as well. Or if not knowing then at least assuming that it can't be as rosy uh, as it's painted. And whilst it was interesting to go into the shops, especially when you don't have the money to buy all the things, but I went to Hamburg by train and without knowing, I left the uh, train station on the wrong side. And it sounds strange, but the first impression I had was, so the junkies are real. They really do exist. And they really look like you saw them on TV. As I said, it was simply not knowing which way to go that I ended up on the, in inverted commas, wrong side of the train station. But it gave me the, the I wouldn't say a totally negative experience, but it certainly brought back that there is um, a level of society which is not necessarily shown in the daily news. Obviously, I knew I couldn't do anything about it, uh, and I also logically knew that there is no way back. So I had to accept it um, and everything which came afterwards because life goes on and you have to make the best out of it. And I was at an age where it was still possible to make the best out of it, and I was willing to do that. Um, I know from people I went to school with who didn't have a proper job since 1990. Um, they're trying to get from one job to the next to the third, but at the same time, they can't imagine 
and even think about leaving their hometown. So I wouldn't say um, I'm doing great compared to others, but at least I can say that I made the best out of what was available to me. I probably missed quite a few opportunities um, to do even better. On the other hand, I know that I did not do anything which harmed other people, friends, family, by going my way. And that, I think, is also um, quite an achievement, considering the significant change in life, which I think is very difficult to comprehend for people who do not have such a significant change in their lives. I would I would kind of probably compare it with people who lost everything in a in an earthquake. Not just a fire, but in an earthquake, where the the entire area they're used to now looks totally different. And even that is not probably coming close to what it feels like when you and the entire system you live in changes. Everything from the legal perspective to the financial affairs, to the way society interacts. Yes, you had a lot of freedoms, and you still, and I still have a lot of freedoms, but it does depend on many other things to utilize these freedoms, and not everyone can. Don't miss the episode extras, such as videos, photos, and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters, and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening, and see you next week.